Gelatin Dessert presents The Johnny Carson Show with his special guest, Rudy Valley. Starring Johnny Carson. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome to another Thursday night. Now, tonight on the show, we've got so many exciting things happening. We've really got a lot of entertainment tonight. And to start things off right, as a special treat on our stage tonight, the very famous television star, radio and stage, Mr. George Burns. George? <laughs> thank you very, thank you very much for coming down tonight, George. Thank you. I know, that's kind of sneaky, but you see, that's all we're permitted to show of him. He's on for a different product. <laughs> no, really, I don't want to know. That's disappointing. People expected to see some celebrities, and that was kind of a trick. But I don't want you to be disappointed, because we do have some celebrities in our audience tonight, as we often do in the show, but we've never introduced them before. So I'd like you to meet some of the folks that we have here with us. First of all, seated right here in the front row, Mr. William Beckendorf. Mr. Beckendorf? How are you, sir? Mr. Uh, Mr. Beckendorf just missed out winning the Nobel Prize last year uh, for science. He was on the verge of inventing the H-bomb, but he just couldn't think of the letter. It was a uh, very tough break. It was too bad. Now, ladies and gentlemen, somebody I know you all recognize. Mr. Frank O'Connor. <laughs> Mr. O'Connor has just returned from a glorious two-year tour of the head-shrinking tribes in Africa. And uh, incidentally, right after the show, he'll be in the lobby autographing heads for those of you who go for that kind of thing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, seated right here, someone who's been a star for many, many years. <laughs> Miss Maggie Williams. <laughs> Miss Williams is leaving for England tomorrow where she's going to make her third attempt to swim the English Channel. Congratulations, Miss Williams. Well, I see you're greased up already. <laughs> Good luck anyway. And now, ladies and gentlemen, a man who really needs no introduction. Mr. Jim King, the gas meter inspector of the Santa Monica area. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Well, I guess that's all the celebrities we have in the audience tonight. Rudy Valley. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't see you. I didn't see you sitting there. Why don't you come up on the stage and just say a little bit? Oh, come on, come on, come on. Be careful, she's greased up. That's it. Oh, that's wonderful. Rudy, I just wanted you to come up on stage and uh, say a couple of words to the, to the people tonight. I'd really like to play. I have my saxophone with me. Oh, I thought it was a tie pin with thyroid trouble. <laughs> no, Rudy, why don't you just say, just say a couple of words and, uh, you know, I'd rather play. I'd rather play if I might. Should have asked Mr. O'Connor. <laughs> he should have done it trick my head. Well, look, Rudy, you don't have... I have a chord in E-flat, please. Rudy. You don't have to play if you don't want to. Okay. You know, just just say one word, like... No, like hello. Play. May I have that chord in E-flat? <laughs> down in front. I want to thank you for coming up. It's very nice of you to come up, Rudy. Thank you so much. <laughs> could have been worse. He could have had the Connecticut Yankees in his pocket. <laughs> anyway, ladies and gentlemen, tonight on with the show, we have a very fine production number for you that I... This is not a telethon, Rudy. Look, <laughs> look, if you want to do something, why don't you come on up? We've got a, an idea in the show later. You know, a very fine sketch. Something I think you'd be perfect in. If, you, if you'd like to, you can go back to the dressing room and they'll have a, have a costume for you. I have to keep this reed wet, otherwise it cracks and they're very expensive. <laughs> look, look, Rudy. look, here's a dollar. Buy, buy a new reed. If you're going to do anything, you know, sing. Thanks. Ed Sullivan never has his trouble. <laughs> Talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. Your magical kiss can take me just so far. 
talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. Don't leave me like this, dangling from a star. You set me all aflame, and it's so pleasing. It sure would be a shame if you were only teasing. So, my love, before I go, turn the light way down low and talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. Talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. Don't leave me like this, dangling from a star. Talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. A magical kiss can take me just so far. You set me all aflame and it's so pleasing. It sure would be a shame if you were only teasing. So, my love, before I go, turn the light away down low and talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. Now, Johnny Carson puts the science of child psychology back 10 years. His topic, how to teach good manners. Uh, you know, kids are, uh, are natural-born imitators. They, uh, well, they do anything that you do. So uh, the best way to teach them good manners is to uh, set a good example, and they'll copy it. Uh, for example, if you want some jello, You, uh, you don't dig in right away, see? You kind of hold it off and admire it, even though you can't wait to taste that tempting flavor. Then you take just a small bite. See, because, uh, well, even the tiniest bite of jello is full of uh, rich fruit flavor. And then eat your jello slowly. <laughs> so you might even take time out to compliment the cook, you see. Now, she knows how good jello is, and she'll, she'll love the compliment anyway. Oh, and by the way, in case somebody offers you some more jello, the thing to do is just kind of hold off for a minute. You see, that, that's good manners that way. Wait a minute, that's mine. Wait a minute. Wait, give me the, 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 oh, well, it's all right, you see. Anyone can lose his, lose his head over jello. Serving soon. The one, the only. <laughs> Commercials are doing better than we are tonight. <laughs> Not a rare event around here. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Encyclopedia of the Air, Thursday night's answer to Omnibus. On this program, those of you who have had a grade school education will be brought up to the level of high school. And those of you who have had a college education will be brought down to the level of high school. <laughs> Our aim on this program is to seek out ignorance wherever it is and divide it equally. <laughs> First subject tonight is the evolution of the dance. And to find out how the dance began, we must go back to prehistoric times. As you know, the Earth went through a series of volcanic eruptions, causing the surface of the Earth often to be covered with hot lava, which caused early man to walk like this. <laughs> and thus was, uh, thus was born the first dance. This dance was usually performed on a Saturday night or any other night in which the earth happened to be hot. <laughs> now, several thousand years later, the American Indian used the dance as a ritual when he wanted rain.
Well, back to Arthur Murray's. <laughs> as years went by, as years went by, the dance took on certain refinements and became a part of man's social life. In the 17th century, the predominant dance was the minuet. <laughs> evolution because the ballet tells a story. Tonight we would like to demonstrate some simple ballet movements. This has no special meaning at all. He's just trying to loosen his tights. <laughs> Next you will see a fundamental ballet step, the entre chassis. See, many ballets take place in fields and meadows, and this is the way you can keep the mud off the shoes. <laughs> this is known as the, haven't I seen you someplace before? <laughs> this movement is called, do you need a new vacuum cleaner? <laughs> and now the bourree. is a device to keep her partner off her feet. <laughs> and at last we see the glissade and the pas de bourree. <laughs> this is a very sneaky way of getting her off stage so the stage hands can lift her. <laughs> now, during the Roaring Twenties, the dance reflected the mood of the times. And in 1929, they were doing this. After the, after the crash in 1929, some men killed themselves by jumping out of windows, others killed themselves with the Charleston. <laughs> now, the Depression had a sobering influence on the dance, and in England, all society was doing the bumps of daisy. <laughs> Plainly see, this is simply an adult version of the children's game, Patty Cake, Patty Cake. <laughs> now, so far we've seen how the times have influenced the dance. But now let's see how the dance has influenced the times with the internationally known Mambo. <laughs> so you can see in 4,000 years, nothing has really changed. Now, turning, turning the pages of the Encyclopedia of the Air, we go from the wonders of nature, or rather, from the dance to the wonders of nature, and present a man who's been a bird watcher for 25 years, Mr. Reginald Dvorak. <laughs> Mr. Dvorak, any man who's lived among the birds as long as you have must have some interesting facts to tell us. <laughs> yes, yes, you. Uh, would you talk English? We have very few birds watching the show. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I hope he doesn't start molting on stage. <laughs> Mr. Dvorak is with us tonight to uh, demonstrate some familiar bird calls. First, the whippoorwill. Well, then, busy. And now we... Uh, the Bob White mating call. <laughs> I think you picked up a live one already. 
Next, the, uh, oh, by the way, I might mention that Mr. Dvorak was decorated for bravery during the last war. He was a carrier pigeon. <laughs> now, the, uh, the love bird. Kind of gives you a little tug, doesn't it? <laughs> the, uh, the hawk. <laughs> would, you mind, would you mind cutting that one out? Someone thinks you're stealing their chicken. <laughs> now, Mr. Bork, I understand that you recently taught a wild canary to sing a song. Is that true? Could you, uh, could you demonstrate? <laughs> Mr. Dvorak at all. This is Mrs. Dvorak. Congratulations. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, next week on our program, you will see an umbrella that was actually used in a peace mission. You will see Duncan Hines sampling blubber steak in the North Pole. <laughs> also on our Encyclopedia of the Era, Kangaroo, this astounding zoological expert, since it was born with a zipper in its pouch. <laughs> a very simple thing to do. Run a fork through a pan of jello, and look, you come out with this bright and very attractive jello dessert. It's called fruited ruby flakes. And could anything be easier? You just dissolve a package of any one of the red flavors, strawberry, raspberry, or cherry, in one cup of hot water. Then add one cup of cold water. Chill until firm in a shallow pan. Then, break into flakes like this with a fork. Pile into serving dishes and serve with a garnish of fruit. Fruited ruby flakes. Just one of the many easy, delicious ways to serve jello. Always look for the big red letters on the box that tell you you're getting the one, the only jello. America's favorite gelatin dessert. <laughs> You know, many, many books and magazine articles have been written about the fabulous 1920s. But even so, it's hard for most of the present generation to visualize what it was really like back there in the days of the uh, Prohibition, Charleston, and F. Scott Fitzgerald. So, at this time, we'd like to take you back to that fabulous era. The scene, the weekly Saturday night dance at the then very swank Sandy Point Country Club. I see you again, Bobo. <laughs> Bill, forgive me for saying so, you're looking rather well, Boo-Boo. You seem to be a very fine spirit yourself. Well, why shouldn't I be? Dad let me have the car tonight. <laughs> I sold it. <laughs> I say, Boo-Boo, could you lend me your handkerchief? Certainly. Here you are. Thank you. Forgot mine. <laughs> Music is very fine this evening at the National Orchestra. Yes, understand it's a new group. They're just starting out. Leader's a Yale man. Oh? forgotten and gone with the dawn of the day. Some you remember. Voice is certainly distinctive. Sure it does. <laughs> Notice he has very large lips. That's a megaphone. <laughs> I, I say, Boo Boo over there, isn't that Lady Wimbledon? My, she is getting large, isn't she? Rather. <laughs> she weighs 300 pounds. Who's she dancing with, her little boy? No, that's, that's her husband, Sir Charles. He is a small one, isn't he? Dancing together, they make quite a picture, don't they? Looks like a man pushing a dead beetle uphill. <laughs> Here they come now.
What, uh, what she sees in him, I'll never know. <laughs> I, I say, Boo Boo, out there on the patio, isn't that, isn't that young Fitzmaurice drowning his wife in the fountain? I believe it is. Should we inform the rules committee? No, I don't believe so. He seems to be using the proper grip. <laughs> That music's divine. I just love those peppy bugles. Oh, what's this? Oh, that's, that's Yvette, our, our new French maid. She's helping out here tonight. Your new French maid? Oh, yes, Dad. Brought her home one night after a director's meeting. <laughs> charming, charming. She's the upstairs maid or the downstairs maid? <laughs> the upstairs maid. How many steps? <laughs> I say, Boo Boo, look over there. It's his mother. Where? Right. Over there, carrying father. <laughs> Who's carrying mother? Mother was a cabot. <laughs> oh, look, here comes old Mr. Mintburn. Understand he celebrated his 98th birthday. How? <laughs> in those sports car races, I'll never know. <laughs> Isn't that Mrs. Van de Bannister? Haven't seen her in a long time. Oh, yes, the poor dear hasn't been getting out much lately. Hasn't really wanted to, you know. Since her husband died, she's been so lonely. He isn't dead, he's hiding. <laughs> How she ever drives in those sports car races, I'll never know. <laughs> Now, Baba. Baba. Bobo. Baba, I want you to meet my best friend, Boo Boo. Boo Boo? <laughs> my fiance, Baba. Baba? Boo Boo. Boo Boo's my best friend. We went to college together. Boo Boo and I played on the same football team. I played quarterback and Boo Boo played. What did you play, Boo Boo? Tackle. <laughs> Who's my best friend? You see, we went to college. Oh, for a celebration. To Boo Boo, Bobo's best friend. Uh, to Baba, to Baba. To Baba, Boo Boo, and Bobo's best friend. <laughs> to Bobo. To Baba. To Boo Boo. Sugar Blues, I, I believe the dance is in. So it is, Baba. May I see you home, Dad? Oh, no, no, no. I'm seeing Baba home. Oh, I, I'm sorry, Boo Boo and, and Bobo, but I have other plans. Ready, baby? <laughs> I don't understand. What, what's he got that we haven't got? The long grain rice gets perfect rice with minute rice. Get perfect rice with minute rice every time. It's so easy to get perfect rice with minute rice every time. There is no other pre-cooked rice. The only one is minute rice. Get perfect rice with minute rice every time. It's so easy. You don't have to wash or rinse it. You don't have to steam or drain. Just add the boiling water. Serve it fancy. Serve it plain. Yes, ma'am, it's just as easy as whistling. It's so easy. You get perfectly perfect rice with minute rice. Before we leave tonight, I want to thank our guest, Rudy Valley. Rudy? <laughs> Rudy, I, uh, I want to thank you. Thank you for taking time out from your play out the Pasadena Playhouse. Uh, Jenny, kiss me. I understand it's going great. Yes, it's doing very well indeed. Yes. Uh, well, it's a real pleasure having you here tonight. Any time you're feeling lonely. <laughs> I'd like to.
to leave a couple of seats for you. All you have to pay is the tax. Harper loves Mambo. <laughs> Harper loves Mambo. Look at him sway with it. Get him so get him. Very far, and I'm there for the Rudy, next two and a half weeks. I'm going to come out and see but the play. I understand you play a 70 year old priest. Well, the blues are going my way. <laughs> it's the gold. Rudy, aren't you going to do anything about that Bing Crosby um, record? Well, oh, I don't worry about Bing. He's as old as I am. <laughs> oh, Next week, next week we have, next week Eva Gabor will be on the show. We'll see you seven days from tonight, and don't forget the seven delicious flavors of Jello. Good night and thanks. <laughs>